All right, let's continue on with our discussion of fluids and electrolytes. I'd like to look at a problem. This is the kind of problem that you will be seeing uh, on homeworks or on the exam for water, uh, fluids, electrolytes, and acid base. Very simple calculation. What is the plasma volume of a 50 kilogram female? This is very straightforward. First, of course, you must calculate the total body water. We know that the total body water for a female is 50% of her weight in kilograms, and that gives you a uh, volume that is expressed in liters. So here we have 0.5, 50% times 50 liters per kilogram, and that gives us a total body water of 25 liters. Now, the plasma volume is a subset of the extracellular fluid volume, so we must next calculate the extracellular fluid volume. The extracellular fluid volume is one-third the total body water, or in this case, one-third of 25, which is uh, eight and a third. We're almost done. Now, the plasma volume is 20% of the extracellular fluid volume, and so in this case it's 20% of 8.33, and that equals oh, about 1 and 2 thirds liters. All right, so let's move along now and talk about electrolytes. First, what are they? Well, electrolytes are substances in your blood and other body fluids that carry an elect electric charge. So for example, sodium uh, is an electrolyte, potassium is an electrolyte, the chloride ion is an electrolyte. There are a number of different substances in the body that have this characteristic that ionize in water. We're going to be talking about um, sodium and potassium, uh, the most important of these substances. And there's really not a whole lot to this uh, part of the lecture. like water your electrolytes in, often abbreviated or, or uh, stated as lights. So lights in have to equal lights out. So if you have a normal amount of sodium and potassium, uh, whatever sodium and potassium you lose, you must replace. Or if you take in excess sodium and potassium, you must then excrete that excess in order to maintain uh, homeostasis. We get the electrolytes from the substances that we eat and drink. We lose and can get rid of the electrolytes primarily uh, in our urine. This next slide is a very important slide. I always ask questions about this slide and I'm always amazed that students don't do well. Sodium is found mostly outside cells, and potassium is found mostly inside cells. In fact, you have a series of pumps that uh, are designed uh, to keep that sodium and potassium balance. So again, remember, sodium is found in the extracellular compartment mostly, and potassium is found mostly in the intracellular compartment. In fact, about 90% of the extracellular ions are sodium ions. We know that the sodium concentration is regulated by the renin-angiotensin system, and the renin-angiotensin system, as we'll get into more detail when we look at the juxtaglomerular apparatus uh, in the kidney, uh, regulates the sodium balance, and aldosterone secretion regulates the potassium ion balance, and uh, the potassium ion concentration is sensed directly by the cells that secrete aldosterone, and I'm sure you all uh, remember where that happens, don't you? Well, don't you? Let's just say a few words about 
the sodium ion concentration, I'm sorry, the potassium ion concentration, the uh, amount of potassium in the extracellular fluid is critical for homeostasis. You normally have a very small amount of potassium found outside the cells, about 4.2 milliequivalents in a liter of body fluid. Contrast that with the uh, amount of sodium found in the same extracellular fluid. And for sodium, the normal amount is somewhere in the neighborhood of 140 milliequivalents per liter. So there's a small amount of sodium found, but this amount is critical. And if, if the uh, potassium ion concentration goes up too high or goes down too low, you'll die. You'll have uh, cardiac uh, irregularities and you will die. So how much exactly are we talking about here? How much potassium uh, in, milli in milliequivalents does a 70 kilogram male have? This is actually a fairly simple calculation. So how many milliequivalents of potassium is in the extracellular fluid of a 70 kilogram male? And assume that the potassium concentration is 4 milliequivalents per liter. So all we need to do is to calculate the volume of extracellular fluid. Multiply that by 4 milliequivalents per liter and we know how many milliequivalents of potassium are found in the extracellular fluid volume. The total body water is, for a man, 60% of the weight and that would express the total body water as liters and here we see that's 42 liters. The extracellular fluid volume is one-third of that or 14 liters and for every liter of extracellular fluid we have four milliequivalents of potassium that gives us in the neighborhood of 56 milliequivalents of potassium. So how much potassium is that? Well it turns out it's very little. In fact uh, the Western diet contains about 70 milliequivalents of potassium uh, a day, which means that you take in more than enough potassium in the course of a day to double your extracellular fluid volume potassium, which we just said is fatal, and yet here we all are. Well, I'm not here, but here you all are. So how does this work? How does our body uh, keep us from getting into trouble when we take in so much excess uh, potassium? And the answer to that is twofold. First, potassium is moved into the cells and it's the extracellular fluid potassium that we need to critically regulate. So if we take that potassium out of the extracellular fluid and move it into the cells, it's no longer a danger to us. After that, the potassium can be excreted into the urine. And as it's excreted, the cells will give up the excess potassium that they moved in and we will once again be uh, in uh, homeostasis. And remember that the hormone aldosterone moves sodium back into the body and helps us to excrete potassium and we excrete the potassium uh, uh, into the urine. And that's about all I wanted to say about the sodium and potassium regulation. And now let's take a little bit of time and look at this subject of uh, acid-base balance. Acid-base balance is a uh, critical uh, uh, information to have uh, when you're taking care of patients. And um, we're going to just touch on it when you get to your clinical rotations, I'm sure you will go into things in much greater detail. <clears throat> but I did want you to understand a few things about acid-base balance. One thing, unfortunately, is that we refer to the amount of acid in the body not as the number of milliequivalents per liter, but rather as a pH. The pH scale is a logarithmic scale. And without getting into the math, uh, just remember that the lower the pH, the more the acidity. Can everyone say that? 
the lower the pH, the more the acidity. One more time. No, I'm serious. All, all together. The lower the pH, the more the acidity. All right, then. So a normal pH is 7.35 to 7.45. Acidosis, a condition in which the body has excess acid, is defined as a body pH of less than 7.35. Alkalosis, on the other hand, a condition in which there is not enough acid in the body tissues, is defined as a pH greater than 7.45. And I'll expect you to know these terms. So where does this acid come from, this acid that we're uh, so interested in controlling? Well, it turns out that we make acid in our bodies all the time. So uh, our metabolic processes, as you see here, when water combines with carbon dioxide to make carbonic acid, the net result of that is the formation of a hydrogen ion, and a hydrogen ion is indeed uh, uh, the acid in the body. So also metabolism of various substances, fatty acids are acids, certain amino acids are acidic, and so on and so forth. So um, our problem uh, is uh, that we make acid And we must keep our acid-base balance between those levels of 7.35 and 7.45 in order to maintain homeostasis. And the body has three ways to do that. It has a chemical buffer system. You can use your respiratory system. And the final arbiter of our body pH is the renal system. So let's just take a brief look at how that works. A buffer, for those of you who have not had chemistry, and perhaps as a reminder from, for those of you who have, a buffer is a, a system that resists a change in acidity by either soaking up acid or giving off acid. And here we see the carbonic acid system acting as a buffer. So if there was excess hydrogen ions, it could combine with bicarbonate to make carbonic acid. And now that free hydrogen ion is no longer in the body fluids, and that reduces the acidity of the body. That same molecule can, if needed, give up a hydrogen ion. So if there's not enough acid, the carbonic acid molecule can disassociate to form a hydrogen ion and a bicarbonate ion. And now you see that the same substance can either take on hydrogen ions, which would reduce the acidity, or it can give off hydrogen ions, which would increase the acidity. And that's a buffer, quite simply. So once again, <clears throat> the, uh, the carbonic acid system can either give off a hydrogen ion or accept a hydrogen ion. Also, this same uh, system can be used to uh, reduce or increase the acidity in the body using our lungs, the respiratory system. So for example, let's just rearrange that equation a little bit and take a look at it here. So this is a chemical reaction. And in a chemical reaction, you have certain molecules combining to form other molecules. And the dynamics of this reaction tell us that if we add uh, molecules to one side of the equation, we'll push the chemical reaction towards the other side. So here, for example, if we added excess hydrogen ions on the left, that would push this chemical reaction to the right and we would make more carbon dioxide. Well, what can we do then to get rid of that excess carbon dioxide? Yes, exactly. We can breathe more rapidly. So you can blow off the excess carbon dioxide and in doing so, you will reduce the acidity in the body. You can, right now, if you wish, 
hyperventilate. If you breathe deeply and rapidly for a few moments, you'll see that you start to get a little dizzy. Why is that? Well, uh, that's because if you breathe rapidly and you blow off your CO2, this chemical reaction will move to the right and the normal acid content in your body will go down because you'll be using up that excess hydrogen ion uh, and pushing the equation to the right. And so your pH will then go up. Yes, remember that the lower the pH, the more the acidity and vice versa. So in this case, when the acid content is too low, the pH goes up and that uh, will cause alkalosis. And alkalosis uh, can uh, and usually does cause a reflex decrease in the blood flow to the brain and so you begin to feel dizzy. Similarly, what would happen, and here's a very common clinical situation, what would happen if for some reason you were not able to ventilate? Let's say that you're having dinner and the fellow behind you, loud boisterous guy, has had too much to drink and he's eating a big thick steak and he's telling a story and all of a sudden he, he stops telling the story and he puts his hand to his throat and he turns very very red and what's happened to him of course is that because he's had too much to drink and because he probably cut a very large piece of steak and because he was talking and eating that piece of steak has wedged in his trachea and now he cannot blow off his CO2 so the CO2 starts to accumulate and this equation is just like a teeter-totter. If you add more hydrogen on one end, you get more carbon dioxide on the other. And if you add excess carbon dioxide, you'll get more hydrogen ions. And that's what's happening in this case. Our diner has uh, stopped his ability to blow off CO2, and now carbon dioxide starts to accumulate in the body tissues. As a result of that, because of this chemical reaction, his acid content goes up and his pH goes down. Now finally uh, we see that the renal mechanism is the ultimate arbiter of our pH. You see that the amount of acidity can be regulated by the chemical systems in the body and we've just discussed how the amount of acid can be regulated by the uh, uh, respiratory activity either retaining or blowing off carbon dioxide and the final uh, the final mechanism is the renal mechanism and the kidneys can quite simply either excrete acid or absorb acid so if there's excess acidity the kidneys will put acid into the urine if there's insufficient acidity the, the kidneys can absorb uh, acid back from the renal tubules and bring it back into the body all three of these mechanisms are used in the body and the timeline is very important so I will expect you to know this slide the buffers the chemical systems react in seconds or less this is nearly instantaneous the respiratory system acts in minutes you can hyperventilate or hypoventilate to adjust your pH and it will take a few minutes for you to get the pH where you need it the renal system acts in hours and so if you knock the body out of homeostasis these salvage mechanisms come into play uh, in that order now we've already seen an example of a buffer system when we looked at how the body carries carbon dioxide uh, in the blood and if you remember the carbon dioxide filters into the red blood cell where it forms carbonic acid and then dissociates to form bicarbonate and an acid ion the bicarbonate leaves the red blood cell and that's how we carry uh, carbon dioxide back from the tissues to the lungs but now we have a problem because every bicarbonate ion that we make we produce an extra acid ion what happens to that acid ion certainly something must be done because if we increase the acidity inside the red blood cell this could be very harmful to the cell well what happens we said was it attaches to the hemoglobin molecule
and that's an example of a protein buffer system. The hemoglobin molecule absorbs that extra hydrogen ion and keeps the red blood cell acidity normal, and then when you get to the lungs, the whole process is reversed. The hemoglobin molecule gives up the hydrogen ion, and you uh, then combine that with bicarbonate to form CO2 and water, and the CO2 is delivered out of your body by your lungs. Now we're only going to say a few more things about uh, acid-base balance. Let's look at some abnormalities of uh, uh, acid-base homeostasis. Well, we've already talked about this one. What happens when the respiratory system fails? For whatever reason, could be that fellow sitting behind us in the restaurant with the piece of steak wedged in his trachea, or it could be <clears throat> that uh, someone uh, is uh, unable to ventilate for a, a variety of reasons. Perhaps they have uh, pneumonia, and pneumonia prevents uh, the exchange of uh, carbon dioxide, knock on wood. In that case, the carbon dioxide level in the body builds up, and that causes an excess of hydrogen ions in the body. And so that moves the body out of homeostasis, making it too acidic, and we call that abnormality when the body is too acidic, acidosis. And in this case, because it's caused by the respiratory system, we call it respiratory acidosis. Respiratory acidosis is the most common acid-base disorder, and it's characterized, of course, by a low pH, because the lower the pH, the more the acidity. Uh, and uh, it's also characterized by a high carbon dioxide content. And when you want to find out what someone's acid-base status is, these are some of the things that you measure. You measure their pH, you measure the carbon dioxide content in the arterial blood, and you measure the uh, base content or the bicarbonate content in arterial blood. What happens when the respiratory system blows off too much carbon dioxide? Uh, hyperventilation. This can happen clinically because someone gets excited and anxious and afraid and they breathe too rapidly and as a result they blow off their carbon dioxide. When that happens this chemical reaction moves from the right to the left and the hydrogen ion is used up which means that they have too little acidity in the body and if the amount of acidity in the body is too low, um, uh, the pH goes up, and in this case we call this respiratory alkalosis. It's characterized by a high pH, remember that would be a pH greater than 7.45, and a low pCO2, because the carbon dioxide level is what determines the acidity uh, in this clinical case. Another uh, case where you see this is uh, if somebody's respirator settings are, are set uh, inappropriately. If you hyperventilate your patient on the respirator, you can um, uh, develop a respiratory alkalosis. And sometimes people do that on purpose because of other things going on with the patient. Now, there are conditions in the body where too much acid is, is made. And these conditions are uh, lumped together in this term metabolic uh, acidosis. So for example, if you um, are a uh, poorly controlled diabetic, um, you can develop excess acidity in your blood. If you go into shock, uh, lactic acid will build up for anaerobic glucose use and you can go into metabolic uh, acidosis. Crush injuries can also do this because of the formation of excess acidity. Severe diarrhea can do it uh, because with severe diarrhea you lose uh, uh, excessive amounts of bicarbonate and uh, alcohol poisoning can also lead to metabolic uh, acidosis because alcohol is broken down in two steps and the first step is the formation of uh, an acid. Now in this 
clinical situation, it's acidosis, so the pH is low, and the bicarbonate level, or the base level, is also low. And that's the characteristic of metabolic acidosis. We've only got one more to go, and here it is. Metabolic alkalosis. So, metabolic alkalosis is a uh, condition uh, in which there is uh, excessive bicarbonate due to the excessive loss of acid. So how ever could something like that happen? Well, we just studied one place where there's uh, where there's lots and lots of uh, acid formed and that's in the stomach. So if somebody has prolonged persistent and severe vomiting every time they vomit remember they're taking acid out of the body and that's going to lower the acid content in the body the acid content in the body goes down too much the pH goes up too much that's alkalosis and here's a tip it's metabolic because it's not respiratory that sounds a little glib but that's how it works if the problem either acidosis or alkalosis is not the result of the lungs the lungs either hyperventilating or hypoventilating, we just call that metabolic. So in this case, it's metabolic alkalosis, characterized by a high pH, of course, because that's what alkalosis is, and a high bicarbonate content. And uh, that's all I have for you, ladies and gentlemen, so I appreciate your uh, attention, and I'm sorry I couldn't be with you um, uh, except in spirit today, if I can, I'm going to come in and try and run this uh, lecture myself, but if I'm feeling too bad, I'm going to see if one of my colleagues can do it. Um, keep an eye on your email. I'll be uh, uh, sending you some uh, homework, uh, perhaps, and uh, some other information might be coming your way, and I'll also post these slides for you uh, in Blackboard. Thank you. Hope to see you um, on Friday, and have a good rest of the day.